Luke chapter number 9, we'll begin reading verse 57. The Bible says, And it came to pass, that as they went in the, in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow, follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at, at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the good singing tonight. Thank you for the good testimonies, the good prayer time, the good fellowship we've enjoyed. And thank you for being a good God. Now, Father, help us from the word of God. Uh, strengthen our faith. Lord, increase our faith. And God, help our hearts to be established in faith. And then certainly edify your people. Lord, meet every need of every heart. Lord, if there's anyone here lost tonight, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. And I certainly do pray that, God, you would continue to help us and bless us in spite of us. Bless now. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. I want you to notice, first of all, in these verses, the eagerness of this young man who comes to the Lord. Look at verse 57. It says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. What a, a, an eager young man who says, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Can I say this is an honorable young man? First of all, he calls him Lord. He doesn't refer to him as rabbi or master. He calls him Lord. Uh, he's honorable. He says, Lord. And he has honorable intentions. He says, uh, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. I'm going to be there. I mean, that's honorable. Uh, how many times have we known people or been in services where people will say, I'm going uh, to follow Jesus. I'm going to do something for the Lord. I'm going to get more involved. Uh, I want to give more of myself to the Lord. I mean, it's honorable to do those things. We see mm, this eagerness in this young man. A lot of times we're very eager for a while. Notice, if you will, the example the Lord gives him. I mean, the Lord doesn't tell him no. The Lord doesn't tell him yeah. The Lord doesn't say yeah, right. Notice the Lord's answer, the example he gives. Verse 58, And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Jesus always used practical things to prove a point. He said, Foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests, he said, but the Son of Man doesn't even have anywhere to lay his head. Uh, what an example. This young man said, I'm going to follow you wherever. And Jesus said, you better think about that. He said, all you know is a comfortable life. You go to the same place, lay down, go to bed at night. Uh, uh, you have your aspirations in life. He said, but I want you to understand what you're signing up for. You know, the foxes have a place, the birds have a place, but I don't have a place. Mm -mm. A lot of times we're real quick to say, Lord, I want to do something. But we realize there's a whole lot more involved doing something for God than just showing up on Sunday and Wednesday. Sure. Now, then I want you to notice, if you will, uh, the excuses that we find in these verses. Look, if you will, in, in verse 59. The Bible says, And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. How many services has God spoke to somebody's heart and then they offer an excuse? Look in verse 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. Notice both of these people have good excuses. Both of them are saying... Lord, I, I have something pressing. 
But notice what the real problem is. In both excuses, in both verses, it says, suffer me first or let me first. They had a me first attitude. You know why people won't serve God? They have a me first attitude. You know why folks aren't faithful? They have a me first attitude. You know why much isn't getting done for God? Because there's too many with me first attitudes. And folks have, offer excuses as to why they cannot do what the Lord is bidding. Can I say, can you imagine if the CEO of your big corporation called you up and said, I want you to come and, and meet with me and have dinner, and you said, well, I would, but i got to go on my lunch break to Target. <laughs> do you think your CEO would appreciate that? Huh? Miss Marcy, I don't know who the president of Farm Bureau is, but if he called you up and said, Marcy, I need to see you, and you said, well, <laughs> i got to go to Dollar General. <laughs> huh? Well, if the president called, and the president said, I'm inviting you to the state dinner where all the heads of state from all across the world will be here, all of the important people in the U.S. will be here, and I want you to personally sit at my table uh, and sit with me, and you say, well, I would, but... You know, Knott's Landing's on TV tonight. You got to be old to remember that one. How do you think the president would take to that? I would, but you know, Walmart's got a big sale. Now, those are crude examples, but I think that the CEO and the president would be offended, would you not? Now, what do you think when the Lord of all glory who made you and made everything and he looks on you and he says, I want you to do something. What a privilege that God would even know our name. Sure. That God would even care about us, but then God would ask us to do something for him. Amen. And then we throw up Walmart, Knott's Landing, Target or whatever else in the Lord's face. How do you think that makes God feel? Don't you know He knows you're down sitting and you're uprising? Sure. Don't you know that He knows everything about you and what you can and cannot do? And don't you know that if He asks you to do anything, He's already equipped you and He's already ready to clear your playing field so you can do what He's asked you to do? And then you offer up some petty excuse or I offer up some petty excuse. How do you think that makes him feel? Yes, Christmas is but for a season, but Christ is forever. Yes, How do you think that makes him feel? We see the examples, we see the excuses, but notice the expectation. This is what God expects from followers, believers, those that have been washed in his blood. Look what he said in verse 60. Jesus said unto him, this guy says, suffer me first go bury my father. That's pretty important. That's bigger than Target. That's bigger than uh, Walmart. That's bigger than Knott's Landing. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm going to go bury my father. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury the de their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Now, if you looked at it in context, the Lord say, saying, you can't help somebody that's already dead. Let the dead bury their dead. But if you look at it spiritually, he says, let the dead bury their dead. Those who are dead in trespasses in sin need life. And that's why I need you to go preach the gospel. Hmm? Notice the other ex uh, uh, expectation from God. Look what he says. Verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, now all the fellow said is, let me go home and say goodbye to mama. I mean, even our soldiers get to say goodbye to mama before they go off and fight. Look what Jesus says. Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Hmm? He's saying, if you're trying to serve me looking backwards, you're useless. Now, that's pretty strong. You can't bury your father, and you can't kiss mama goodbye. 
That's awfully strong. Now Jesus is not being insensitive. He is not saying you can't attend a funeral. He's not saying you cannot say goodbye to people. He is giving an illustration and a point. What is he saying? He is saying that a follower of Jesus Christ, first of all, must sacrifice. If you're going to live for Jesus and truly be the follower that he expects you to be, there are some things you're going to have to say, I can't make it. Jesus is more important. Yeah. Amen. Now all across Christianity and all across the Baptist churches in America, Wednesday night services are becoming a thing of the past. And the reason a Christian school will schedule something on Wednesday night is because too many Christians for too many years have been saying, Lord... Wednesday night's not that important. It is to Jesus. It is to the local church. Now again, I'm not talking about being providentially hindered. I'm talking about folks not willing to sacrifice. There are sometimes you've got to tell outside activities, no. I'm not going to do it because Jesus is too important. Hmm? A follower in Jesus must sacrifice. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. In other words, Jesus is more important than what I even have a right to do. Amen. Can I say? Followers of Jesus must not only sacrifice, but they must be selfless. Can't have a me first attitude and follow Jesus. Amen. You've got to be selfless. Huh? It amazes me the petty excuses that you get why people can't come to church. I understand when you're really sick and you're contagious, please don't come. But I promise you, talk to her, she's not feeling good right now. Huh? I'm sitting here right in front of her about ready to start screaming and her head's pounding anyway. It's all that sinus and everything. She don't feel good, but she's here. Huh? Do you know how many times the pastor has come to the house of God not feeling well but still is here? You know why? The pastor has to be selfless. But I've got news for you. The old adage, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. From the pulpit to the back pew, we're all to be selfless. Yeah. Amen. Hmm? I said a few weeks ago, and some of you got mad, but sometimes you just got to suck it up, buttercup. Sure. It amazes me you won't miss Good Friday. You won't miss work. You won't miss a family activity, but you'll miss church. Because Jesus don't mean that much to you. Hmm? But see, a follower in Christ has to be selfless. You must sacrifice. You must be selfless. I don't know the last time I went to a family reunion, because most of the time they have them on Sunday. Hello? I'm with my family every Sunday. Hmm? You remember when Jesus' mother and stepbrothers and sisters come to see him and he's preaching to the multitude and his disciples says, your mother and your brethren are here. And he said, behold my mother, behold my brethren. Now, he's saying, I'm with my family. Amen. By the way, we don't find anywhere in the scriptures where stepsisters or stepbrothers outside James even believed on him. But there was a crowd who did, and that's who he was catering to. Can I say something else about a follower of Jesus Christ? A follower of Jesus must have a servant, servant mentality. What he is teaching them, when they said, we want to follow you, do you really? Because you've got to be a servant. Amen. Because Jesus is Lord. And where he goes, I will follow. We must be servants to him. Not servants to the flesh, not servants to the world, not servants to family. Not ser We're to be servants to him because he bought us and paid for us right. with his own blood. Amen. Well, now that you're about to pass out, I was really uh, looking at this passage. I was reading some scripture. I came across this passage, and I was interested in verse 58. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. And here it is. 
but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And I could not get away from that last line of that verse. And I want to preach for just a few minutes on this thought. Do you have room for Jesus? He says, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Have you got room for Jesus? Hmm? Now we know when he was born in the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2, it says and there was no room for them in the inn. He came into this world with folks not having room for him. But can I say... Some 2,000 years later, some that he has bought with, with his own blood, uh, some that he has saved and given eternal life, given them the hope and the promise of heaven, uh, they still don't have room for him. Sure. Do you, though, have room for Jesus? Can I say, first of all, does he have an audience with you? Boy, we, we shout and are excited to hear that we have access to the throne of God and any time we're burdened, any time we're weighted down, uh, we can take our petitions to Him. Uh, we can boldly come to His throne. Uh, we can lay it down at His feet. Uh, we can unload on Him. He said, cast all your cares upon me for I care for you. Uh, uh, we get excited about that, that we can have an audience with Jesus. But I wonder, uh, does He have an audience with you? Do you have room for Jesus? Hmm. Does he have an audience with you? Let me ask you this. Do you think about him? The Bible teaches us where to meditate on the things of God. How much do you think about Jesus? How much do you think on heavenly things? And on spiritual? Do you have room for Jesus in your thinking? I, I don't know uh, how many hours a day you're awake and how many thoughts run through your mind. Uh, and if you're like me, you can't remember some that do run through your mind because you're getting old. But I wonder, in all you're thinking and all you're doing while you're driving, while you're on your job, uh, while you're sitting in traffic, and uh, 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 while you're going through the course of your day, how much do you think about Jesus? Amen. Does he have an audience with you? Do you have room for him while you're thinking? Wonder about this. Uh, mm, do you talk with him? God speaks to us through His Word. We speak to Him in prayer. Yep. Sure. Mm, does He have an audience with you? Do you just talk with Him? Now I'm not talking about them. Now God, yeah. Yeah. Thou Father, <laughs> that flungeth the stars out on nothing and calleth them by name. Uh, Thou, Heavenly Father, uh, I implore upon you uh, uh, to meet with me. I'm not talking about all that impressive type stuff. I'm talking about do you talk with him? You say, Lord, I know you got a lot on your plate, but I just want to tell you I love you today. Do you talk with him? Lord, you've been good to me. I just want to thank you for that. Do you talk with him? Does he have an audience with you? Huh? You know, I was there when Miss Lisa said her vows to Brother Mike. You know, all that in sickness and in health and death do his part and all that. When you see him at night at dinner, you don't say in sickness and in health until death do his part and all that stuff, do you? No, you just talk to him. How was your day? You know, you feeling okay? Looking a little peaked? Was dinner good? I mean, just have conversation. Can we go watch Hallmark and that kind of stuff? <laughs> Do you just talk with him? Does he have an audience with you? He made you the way he made you. He don't want you to try and impress him. He just wants to spend time with you. Do you think on him? Do you talk with him? Does he have an audience with you? Hmm? Huh? Do you have room for Jesus? How much time do you spend with him? I'll just spend time with the Lord. Spend time reading about Him. Spend time talking to Him. Spend time thinking about Him. How much time do you give Jesus? Foxes have their holes. Birds of the air have their nests. The Son of Man hath nowhere to lay down His head. Do you have room for Jesus? Hmm? Can I say this? 
The vast majority of people that go to church, the only time they really give Jesus is while they're in church. That is a sad commentary. Hmm. That's why we don't have revival. That's why churches don't have service on Wednesday anymore, and some not on Sunday anymore. What's the point? They're just going through the motions anyway. They really haven't had church in a long time. Hmm? Do you have room for Jesus? Do you, does he have an audience with you? I'm going to ask you this. Does he have room in your aspirations? Your goals, your dreams. Where does Jesus fit in? Amen. Hmm? Do you have room for him? You make all these plans for your life. Do you plan them around Jesus? Does he have room in your desires? I mean, deep down when nobody else is around and you look down in your heart what you really want out of life. Where's Jesus? Where does he rate and rank? Do you have room for him in your desires? Do you have room for him in your devotion? Huh? Somebody once said, where your heart is, there also is your treasure. Amen. How much of your heart is devoted to him? Do you have room for him? If you used to be honest with him tonight and get out a pad of paper and start writing down all the things you love and all the things you love to do, how far do you get down before you get to him? Wow. Amen. I mean, just being honest, because he already knows the answer. Just being honest. Do you have room for him? Hmm. Do you have room for him in your aspirations in your daily events? Do you have room for him? Hmm. Maybe there are some things that people are so addicted to that isn't illegal, so they don't really think it's a crime, but it takes away from Jesus. Hmm. Do you realize one day we're going to stand and give an account of all the time that we've had since we've been saved? Sure. How much does he fit into your daily activity, your daily events? Hmm. I read this quote today as I, my outline was already done. I read this quote, I thought that's good. Busy schedules don't steal priorities. They reveal them. Let me say that again. I thought that was pretty good. Busy schedules don't steal priorities. They reveal them. Amen. When you're so busy that you don't have for time for Jesus, you're really revealing that you don't have time for Jesus. You don't have room for him. He's a bother to you. Until you're sick, or your children's sick, or you lose your job, or you got bills and you can't pay them, then all of a sudden it becomes pretty important. Mm -hmm. Brother Larry Seal said this one time. He said, you can set a dog on fire and he'll run for a while. That's that guy in that first verse. He's eager. eager. He wants to follow the Lord until the pressure gets on. Yeah. Hmm? There are a lot of people, boy, on Sunday, they, they, they love Jesus. Or a lot of people, I, I notice this, when people have needs or people are sick, boy, they're here. But as soon as they get to feel better and all their bills are paid, you don't see them for a while. Hmm? They're not fooling me. Do you think they're fooling Jesus? Hmm? Amen. Do you have room for Jesus? Does he have a place to abide in your life? That's what he's saying in this verse. Verse 58, he doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. You remember the story of the man of God and the widow woman, Zarephath there, that uh, built up the room for him. And Elisha and Gehazi had come by. She said, you always got a room right there. That's the man of God's room. She dedicated that whole room on their, in their property for him. So whenever you need a place, there it is. I wonder if you've got some rooms built up around your life for Jesus. Whenever he wants to come by, he can abide there. Hmm? Hmm. Does he have a place to abide in your heart? 
Are you saved by his grace? And if you are, do you have a heart for him? Jeremiah 2, 2, one of my favorite verses, I remember thee and the love of thine espousals when thou wentest after me in a wilderness in a land that was not sown. God remembers when we first got saved and how excited we were of him. He looks at our heart tonight. Has he seen that same excitement? Does he have a place to abide in our hearts? Do you have room for him? Does he have a place to abide in your home? You know, the direct reflection of weak churches reveals that those that attend the church have weak homes. So go the home, so go the church, so go the nation. How real is Jesus in your home? If folks come to your home, do they have to look around to find Jesus? Or do they know Jesus has been there? Hmm? Does he have a place to abide in your hobbies? Hmm? There's a lot of folks do a lot of things that they'd never think about doing them in church. If you can't do them in church, you don't need to do them outside church. That's right. Because if he's not welcome when you're in here, if it's not welcome for him in here, then it shouldn't be welcome for him out there because he's not welcome in it out there. Hmm? Do you have room for Jesus? Does he have your attention during worship? I know this know enough about people. We get so busy, and there's so many people that realize that they have to come to church, and that's all they get out of it. They have to come to church. And they're so busy that when they come here and they sit down, that's the first time they've relaxed in about three days. And while they're here, their mind's everywhere but Jesus. Amen. Some people are numb. Some people, while they're sitting here, their mind's reeling is what they've got to do after they leave here. I just want to know, do you have room for him? Does he have your attention when you're here? Hmm? How many times when you remember, think back, Brother Bob. Remember when you went to school? How many times do you have to have teachers say, can I have your attention? Y'all pay attention? Y'all look up here at me, pay attention? Huh? Well, that's what Jesus has to do every church service. Are you paying attention? Look up here, pay attention, pay attention. You don't think you need this, but you need it more than you think you do, and you're going to really need it next week. Pay attention. But does he really have our attention? Used to, his old building, every now and then I'd, I'd throw out there a little question. I'd give a little prize, and I'd ask people, you know, what did I preach on this morning if it's Sunday night? You'd be amazed how many people couldn't remember. Most time his kids didn't remember. Hmm. Huh? Because we really don't pay attention. The Bible says in the last days there will be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. Amen. Do you have room for Jesus? Can you just give him a little time while you're here to pay attention? Hmm? We pay attention to Hallmark movies, don't we? Oh. That was a good one on over the weekend. Christmas in Rome. Did you see that one? That was a good one. I recommend that. And then there was one in Christmas Town. That was a pretty good one too. Huh? Now I can remember all that. Why can't I remember when I come to church? Amen. Well, you can sit and watch a movie and memorize half of it. But we come to the house of God, can't even sit here 45, 50 minutes and listen to a message and our mind's not. Amen. Do you have room for it? Hmm? Let me say this. I appreciate a lot of you take notes and you revisit your notes and you apply the notes. That's a real blessing. But can I say this? A lot of times you can get caught up so much in taking notes that you're not paying attention. You're not hearing what's being said. Amen. Amen. Yep. If you really want to catch up on it and get again, we, we tape everything. Everything's available on CD and everything's available on YouTube. You can go back and catch up on it. Take notes then. A lot of times we use those tools to take notes to really divert our attention from what's really being said. I'm not telling you not to take notes. Some of you are already overthinking. Oh, I can't take notes no more. Brother Doug said, said not to take notes. I didn't say that. <laughs> Just while you're taking notes, make sure you take note of him. Right. Amen. Let me say this lastly, because some of you have gotten real pale here tonight. 
I'm just asking a question. Do you have room for it? You know what? If, if you're not guilty, then you don't have anything to fret about. Hmm? You're not guilty. You can go on about your business. But if you got real quiet and you're getting real pale and some of us get close to heart, might need to pay a little bit more attention to him. Amen. Sure. Let me say this lastly. Do you have room for Jesus? Does he have your abandonment? Amen. You don't hear preaching on being abandoned to God anymore. Men that had real faith, women that had real faith, they said if it meant dying and going to heaven to have as much of God as I want, let me die. But see, in our day and age, we want him to fit into our little box of time that we got so we can go on and live our life. We don't want to die for him. We certainly don't want to live for him. Abandonment means you depend on nothing but him. Amen. One of my favorite writers, Oswald Chambers, said this. In abandonment and surrender, we find the unbridled soul one not tempted by the treasures of the world, but bound to the grace and glory of the Savior. When you are abandoned to Jesus, you are a slave to the Master. Amen. Where he say goeth, you go. Yeah. But see, we, we can't preach on abandonment anymore because we can't even get people back Sunday night. You start preaching that way, you'll run them off. But the truth of the matter is, does he have your abandonment? Are you abandoned to God? Paul wrote it this way in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Not acceptable unto the community, not acceptable unto the workplace, not acceptable unto your family, not acceptable to everybody else, acceptable unto God. Does he have room for you? Or do you have room for him? He goes on to say, which is your reasonable service. That's reasonable considering what he did for you. He went to Calvary for you. He was beaten. He bled and died for you. He took your sins so you could go to glory. He goes on to say, and be not conformed to this world, but be a transformed by the renewing of your mind. That gets back to thinking about him. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me ask you again, do you have room for Jesus? Or do we just get churchy on church days and do we just get holy around Christmas time or do you really have room for Jesus? Because I can't help but think that if we really had room for Jesus, more of the community would take note and more people would be flocking to see more about this Jesus we serve. The indictment of today is they look at us and they didn't see enough worth coming out to see. Yeah. They say their problems are the same as problems I got. Why would I want their God? It's kind of like in some of the places uh, uh, in third world countries, all the cults are there and build these big, beautiful buildings, and we, we put up sticks and, and grass roofs and expect people to come out and worship God. And they say, Your God must not be that good. They ought to see something in us that says, boy, what they have I need. Amen. And see, they don't see that if we don't have room for Jesus because all that they really are looking to see is Him right. in our lives. Now again, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man hath not anywhere to lay His head. He's looking for somebody that's got some room for Him. How about us tonight? Do you have room for Jesus? Say, preacher, I haven't been doing a good job. I haven't had a lot of room for him. Well, why don't you change that tonight? Yeah. Start making room for Jesus. Yeah. Quit making excuses and make room. And whatever he asks you to do, it's a privilege to do anything for Jesus. And friend, <laughs> it'll never cost you more than what he'll replace it with, I promise you. Why don't you just make room for Jesus? We all did that.
that would change our church, change our community, may even change our country. But it certainly will change you and your home if you'll make room for Jesus. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. While they're picking out a song, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we sure do love you. God, forgive us of the times we don't make room for you. Forgive us of the times that you stand outside the door and knock, like in Revelation chapter 3. Just wanting to come in and sup with us, and yet we're so busy we don't take time to sup with the Master. Now, Father, I pray you'd speak to hearts. You already have tried. But just like we said early on, when people want to have self-justification, it's going to take you to open their eyes for them to ever get the help they need. Lord, help us not to seek self-justification, but help us to seek your touch. Yes. Help us to seek your approval. We want the acceptable, perfect will of God in our lives. My Father, have your way in this invitation. Speak to hearts. Certainly, if somebody's here not saved, I pray they come and give their heart and life to Jesus. I pray every saved folks, saved folk here tonight would get a heart to make more room for Jesus in their life. Get glory to your glorious name. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.